Are you willing to acknowledge that uh, sanctuary city policies uh, puts the life of the uh, citizens in danger? And are you willing to make any changes to that policy? Anyway, thank you um, all for being here, and first and foremost, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, some of the changes I'm proposing and putting on uh, the next Board of Supervisors meeting, which is April 9th, Tuesday, April 9th, uh, are, are directly related to our concern about the circumstances uh, surrounding Bambi Larson's death that is considered here, just like in uh, municipal government, and just like in other places in, uh, in the county. A horrific tragedy uh, that everyone would have liked to uh, have done something uh, to prevent, if that were possible. That said, uh, often uh, uh, these kind of circumstances are, are well without, outside of, uh, of our control or anyone's control, uh, but we have uh, worked with county officials, we, especially my office, uh, over the past week uh, to look at uh, areas uh, where we might be able to help eliminate communication breakdowns and communi communication concerns um, in the system currently uh, as, as it relates not only to ICE or federal agencies uh, who are uh, attempting to, to take custody of people, uh, but also how it relates to, to our own decision-making here uh, in the Sheriff's Department, uh, in, our, in our own law enforcement uh, world here at the county, in our jails, uh, and how that how communication improvements there and clarification about when notifications, particularly uh, to ICE, uh, can and should take place uh, might uh, make a difference uh, sometime in the future. So with that, there are three elements uh, to what I'm proposing. Uh, number one is uh, I'm, I'm asking and directing, if the Board of Supervisors uh, approves my ask, we will be directing the, the county administration uh, to work with the sheriff, uh, with the chief of police in San Jose, uh, with the chief's association uh, here, uh, with other law enforcement agencies, uh, to put together notification protocol uh, consistent with SB 54. Uh, which is uh, the state law now known as Values Act, uh, which generally defines what you can't do and what you can do in terms of, of notifications. The issue of detainer, I think most of you know or have heard or have interviewed somebody who has clarified, uh, including me, uh, that detainers are, are not something that we can do here. We can't do holds. No law enforcement agency uh, is supposed to be doing those uh, under federal, federal law currently. The courts have struck down the constitutionality of, of doing holds, uh, which again uh, leaves us to look uh, to a notification policy to see if it's possible when we receive a notice from ICE or a detainer from ICE under certain serious crimes, uh, felonies, uh, where there seems to be a significant danger to the community because of past bad acts that are on somebody's rap sheet, uh, that the sheriff can communicate that uh, and know when it's okay to communicate when it's not. So number one, we'll call for that all to be accomplished within 30 days uh, with that coalition of folks working on it. But again, uh, the, the system improvement would be uh, identifying under SB 54 exactly the, the enumerated crimes uh, which would cause a notification in the, in the first place rather than leaving that ambiguous. Uh, second, uh, we have long said here at the county and we still say, I say, that uh, arrest warrants uh, are the proper way to, to deal with transfers, custody issues between federal agencies in the county of Santa Clara or any local law enforcement agency. For example, to our knowledge, in our sheriff's knowledge, uh, all federal law enforcement agencies use arrest warrants and post those. Uh, those are available on dispatch systems cities and counties throughout the country. 
uh, when they are trying to take somebody into custody, uh, with the exception of ICE. ICE does it, uh, but they don't do it uh, consistently. They have a preference uh, for inquiring as to whether or not uh, discretionary holds or what we call voluntary holds uh, can be done without arrest warrants. Only three times last year did ICE uh, come to the County of Santa Clara with an arrest warrant uh, for their deportation purposes involving some involving an inmate in our jails. And all three times, uh, expeditiously, uh, that inmate was turned over to ICE. Uh, we will do that with the uh, uh, U.S. Marshal, do it with the FBI, uh, or any other federal law enforcement agency uh, if they have an arrest warrant. There's immediate cooperation and to the extent that we need to hold somebody until they get here, we can then do it because it's unconstitutional. To the extent a police officer on patrol stops somebody on the streets, perhaps an MS-13, and uh, is pulling up uh, the rap sheet from dispatch, immediately that arrest warrant would, would show up and, and allow that suspect uh, to be held uh, until further communication uh, or transfer to ICE could occur. Uh, those That system is not in play or in place at all right now. Uh, and the second part of my proposal is to direct uh, our county sheriff and our county administration to work with San Jose Police Department, given the size of their law enforcement agency, uh, to re-engage ICE. We've done it before, but to re-engage them, uh, it hasn't been done for a few years, uh, to try to establish once and for all an arrest warrant system with them that can be dependent upon, that's clear uh, to everybody real time, every step of the way, when they need to take somebody into custody. Uh, lastly, I'm asking uh, for a third item, which is uh, a, a deep analysis of our probation supervision system. Uh, as you know, uh, in this particular case, uh, the allegations are that that the suspect, the murderer, uh, had severe mental health issues, that was perhaps operating, uh, trying to function uh, in the midst of a drug-induced psychosis, uh, perhaps methamphetamine. And, and this same suspect was in and out of systems at the county, uh, other than our jail system, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, could have used a 50, 51, 52 hold or some other tools available uh, to deal not only with the suspect's well-being but to, to make sure that he didn't hurt himself or others. Uh, we want to take a deep look at that, a deep dive into uh, all of our systems to see if there's something that we can do, whether, whether we're dealing with um, an individual who is documented or undocumented, or whether we're dealing with somebody who is uh, being looked for by, by the feds or somebody who's a local resident, uh, even a local citizen, is there something more we could do uh, to prevent uh, this uh, propensity for violence that we get when we get uh, folks that are unsupervised um, with these kinds of issues uh, going on in their life? Uh, so those are the three recommendations. Um, I think uh, the first one is probably, what I keep calling the first one, the notification changes are probably uh, the most significant uh, pieces of, of the recommendation in terms of, of, of changes that would occur most immediately. I'm calling for those changes to be implemented within 30 days. I hope uh, that gives you an overview. I know that there's uh, paperwork being handed out in terms of the actual referral memo that's going to the Board of Supervisors, the actual transmittal, and I know you haven't had much time to look at it, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And, and I can, obviously I'll be available for uh, to answer questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if, if that's what you prefer. Questions? Uh, uh, the chief of police and also the mayor have emphasized uh, very much that they want the changes in the Santa Clara County policy, but at the same time, they don't want to send the wrong message to the undocumented uh, residents law-abiding that live in the Santa Clara County. Uh, what would be your comments uh, regarding this? Yeah, this, we are, we are proud of the fact that we've created a safe environment here for immigrants. We're proud of the fact that we were the second county in the country 
um, several years ago to realize that these civil detainer holds were unconstitutional. And we were proud of the fact that we've been able to protect a lot of people from uh, being detained uh, sometimes for months and even as long as a year uh, in county jails because of holds that were unconstitutional that were done without warrants. And we'll continue to be steadfast in that regard. We've invested about $9 million in rapid response programs and, and legal assistance uh, for immigrants. We are assisting folks to make sure that they have proper and effective assistance of legal counsel for their hearings before magistrates if they do, uh, if they are apprehended by ICE and they're, they're without legal counsel. Uh, so we'll continue to do all of those things. None of this is in any way uh, any kind of abdication, abdication of our responsibility uh, to protect everyone in this county uh, and their rights as a person under the Constitution of the United States. Uh, what we're seeing, though, is that when you have massive communication breakdowns between the federal government, uh, local municipal police agencies, uh, and county agencies, that, that that's not good for anyone. And uh, I don't, for a minute, um, stand here and tell you that the county takes responsibility for that entire system that involves federal communications, city and police communications, and county communications. Um, we can do whatever we can to take care of our side of the street and try to give as much detail as possible as to what's okay and what's not okay in terms of notifications. But we're going to be uh, careful to narrowly craft what we say is okay for the sheriff to do in terms of notifications. So it's really focused on, on, on folks that at least uh, there's some serious concern about releasing back on the streets. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, I think the Board of Supervisors is going to be generally in favor of tightening up those notification rules because uh, ambiguity is not our friend. It's not our friend and it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't help uh, anyone in, in, in the system to do law enforcement the way they would like, including us at the county level. Uh, I think a warrant system, um, if there's reason that the feds have, for actually picking up somebody immediately, they should use a warrant system because not only does that ensure that that sus suspect can be held, uh, but also I think protects the, the police officers themselves who are on patrol so that they have the appropriate information as to who it is that they're apprehending and, and who it is that's looking for them. In the absence of that information, uh, police officers are stepping into situations in this city uh, where they don't ask and they don't tell whether there's somebody has documentation or not, but ICE is not telling them either whether that person needs to be apprehended immediately because of some safety concern. So the police officers themselves, uh, you have to, to realize, are, are operating under a great deal of lack of information, and some of it is because of good policies they have in place because they don't want to keep registries uh, over at the police department on who's documented, who's undocumented, nor do we at the jail. Uh, so, so given that backdrop, the question is how do we communicate with ICE and hopefully this is a huge step in the right direction. Have you spoken with any immigrant advocacy works like Siren about this? Some, yes, and we're continuing to do that right now, real time. Uh, they, uh, of course, there's, there's, this is one of those issues where you can easily have a slippery slope in either direction. You, you could have uh, too much discretion being applied to people being apprehended who shouldn't be for, in the context of disruption to their families, disruption to their own uh, immigration process or naturalization process may be in, in process. I had somebody uh, in my office this week who had a, a drug offense 19 years ago uh, who is still not naturalized and not fully documented, but has two small children, has been married and gainfully employed um, since that time. And so I think immigrant advocates have a justifiable uh, justifiable argument, and I, I share that argument, I share that concern, uh, that we don't want to be deporting a breadwinner who's been a hard-working resident of this community, contributing 
not only to the economy, but to the well-being of all of us, perhaps contributing to the safety of our community uh, and, and end up breaking up a family. Uh, on the other hand, um, we can't have you know, MS-13 gang members um, uh, bailing themselves out you know, instantly um, and back on the streets who really are a threat, whether or not they, <laughs> they had any kind of, of citizenship, paper, not citizenship papers, but visa or, or legal right to be here. Um, if the federal government knows that they're here um, and they want to take custody of them to interview them and find out what they're doing here, um, we think that's the other end of the spectrum. If you don't do that, if you don't do that, if you can't communicate well enough to even stop a terrorist, uh, then we've taken the slippery slope the other way, a little too far in the other direction. So this is not stuff that should be determined by sound bites. It shouldn't be determined by hysteria. It shouldn't be dis determined by the last big crime that happened. It shouldn't be determined by me or the mayor uh, shouting at each other. It should be determined by you know, what are the best practices that we can employ in a broken immigration system to make sure that people are protected here, uh, but also that uh, people are protected in terms of public safety as well. Whether they're being protected because they're hardworking residents of the community, or they're being protected uh, from somebody who really should have been apprehended by the feds, um, that is a very, um, that is a very, that is not a clear bright line, but it's something that we're going to continue to pursue with this, uh, with this uh, proposal that I'm making April 9th to see if we can at least tighten things up a little bit in terms of the communication. No, I think the laws have continued to evolve uh, in this area. You know, when we first did our civil detainer policy, for example, when we first took it up in 2010, there, there was no federal case law that said whether or not it was unconstitutional to hold. We had 399 people in detention here in Santa Clara County, uh, which I think is, is considered and has been considered a progressive county relative to the national scene. Uh, but how did then do we end up with 399 um, immigrants in our in our jail. 99% of them who have Latino surnames, no one else represented demographically from the community in our jails, um, and all but 26 of them for infractions and misdemeanors. How does that happen uh, in a progressive county? Uh, but, so we made a legal change and said we're not going to do that anymore. Um, just within 18 to 24 months later, the federal courts began to rule in case after case that we were right, that it was in fact unconstitutional. So the law changed. As the law changes, um, other counties then began to adapt and, and fall into line. Not all, but many, many started uh, you know, dropping the detention policy in secure communities. And finally, the secretary of Homeland Security called me on the phone as President of the Board of Supervisors and said, we are dismantling secure communities. Trump got elected and he said, I'm bringing secure communities back. So the law changed again. And, and this is what we're experiencing and this is why I think this kind of undulation, this kind of change, not only in the federal case law, in the administration in the White House, uh, in Homeland Security, in, in who the uh, Attorney General for the United States is on any given day has, has a huge impact on what we have to react to. Some people have asked the question, why is the county involved in immigration at all? And my, my response is, is because it is right here uh, where people who are immigrants, documented or undocumented, come for clarification on what their rights are. It's our court system here that is dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's our jail system and the San Jose police officers that are dealing with people and so we're having to adapt and change, modify. I think we've done a good job of staying as consistent as possible. Um, and we're, we're not trying to make radical changes here. We always had a notification policy. It was just um, one sentence, uh, which I don't think provided a lot of clarity um, for the sheriff. And I think the sheriff erred on the side of uh, when in doubt, um, 
in terms of discretion. I'm not going to notify him and I'll look for a warrant. I can't speak for her, you'd have to speak for her. We're trying to we're trying to assist her because we're the public policy people for the county and say let us let's put a little more meat on the bones, let us try to clarify, do a little bit more in terms of clarification as to what you should and shouldn't be doing in terms of notifications in the hope that um, that dovetails a little bit better with what we're reacting to in terms of not only a broken immigration system at the federal level, but frankly, um, you know, a very oppressive approach by the federal government right now. Are you willing to acknowledge that uh, sanctuary city policies uh, puts the life of the uh, citizens in danger? And are you willing to make any changes to that policy? I think what puts citizens in danger is um, something that us lawyers call malice of forethought. It's a, it's, a, it's a mental frame of mind that says, I um, intend to hurt somebody. And I think that happens whether someone's documented or undocumented. I think it happens all over the world. We've seen tragedy uh, in New Zealand recently. It, it happens as a problem in terms of, of human nature. And sometimes it happens because of significant mental health issues uh, or some kind of reaction, rage, some kind of reaction. We need to look at those parts of our system. Uh, there's, it's very, very difficult to make any kind of causation, nexus, between what kind of passport somebody has and uh, whether or not they're going to commit a crime. I, 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 won't, I won't go there and I, I won't endorse any kind of approach like that. But what we're talking about here today is, is not whether or not we judge someone's documentation as the cause for a crime, but whether or not we should um, be trying to improve our communication with federal authorities um, under the circumstances that we find ourselves in now, again, which is a broken immigration system. We're trying, like I said, we can only control those aspects of, of the system that find their way uh, into, into our county systems. Anything else? Okay. Thank you again for being here.